happening today is a brief introduction to the basics of game theory. Uh, this is written by Matthew Jackson, who's a sort of a famous economist. Uh, he's currently in Stanford, um, and that's presented by me. Uh, that's my name. So uh, let's open with the fun stuff, which are a bunch of definitions. Um, so game theory, let's just define game. And the game is defined by uh, players, actions, timing, and payoffs on, uh, or utilities of players. Um, so these are very generic. And then I've written down the actual definitions for you beforehand. So here we go. There. Only look at the section that's been lit up by the projector. <laughs> so uh, players, you know, you have to define how many players out, uh, are out there. Uh, so you can, th in this case, it's like a set of um, people or whatever, um, or entities. And so they're just like from 1 to n, whatever. And then player i, uh, one of these players, has a set of actions, which is represented normally by a, ai. And it's also called pure strategies, which brings me to, oh shit. Oh, no, no. Yes, here. Definitions, yes, pure strategies. Um, so because there's pure strategies, you'll ask, so what is a not pure strategy? And then the opposite of pure strategy is mixed strategy. And then we'll talk more about that later. Uh, for now, just, just bear with me with all these definitions. Um, and then there's also this A. Uh, in the paper, the author uses small a. I find that super confusing. I think he meant the big A, which represents a set of all the possible pro uh, profiles of pure strategies. And then this is like, you know, a set of uh, actions for player one, set of actions for player two. And then you can just kind of like pick and choose one of them from each set. And then so that it's representing like the whole possible set. And then that is A, big A. And then there's a generic element is represented as A, which is just, just like it, it's made of like you know, one action from each player. Um, and then the last definition here uh, is what we just now talked about briefly, which is that payoffs and utilities, or sometimes called utilities, um, which is a function of action to uh, a set of actions to a value. Um, and then normally a utility, it's a single player's utility uh, defined by an action profile being a set of actions, including the player's own action and other player's action. So these are just dry definitions, just to just want to get that out of the way, since I know you all read the paper, so you all know what I'm talking about. Um, cool. So let's move this away. Um, so mentioning like game theory, I think everybody's like first reaction, whoever's heard of game theory, heard of prison uh, dilemma. Um, and then let me just use this. I know you all understand this game in particular. Who doesn't know about prisoner's dilemma? Okay, cool. So you all know this game. So I'm just going to use this game to explain this notation, the table notation here. Um, so you have two prisoners, uh, player one, player two, and then they have their action, their available actions are either C or D. C stands for some say cooperative uh, or cooperate, or uh, I, I like to see it, C as cover each other up, so it's cover up, uh, or D, D stands for defect. Um, so when they both choose to cover each other up, they get a much lesser, less sentence. Uh, therefore, their uh, payoff is both negative one. Uh, in this case, they will still be punished. It's just the pun punishment is less severe. So therefore, both are uh, negative one. Um, however, if player one decide to cover up player two, well, player two um, decide, decide to rat player one out. In this uh, particular scenario, uh, then player two is going to get rewarded with a neutral, like they get a, he, he or she get away with the crime while player one gets punished more severely. And then this, this action is mirrored here. So 
numbers are reflected here. So the first, in, in this table, the first numbers in the pair uh, represent player one's utility, while the second numbers represent player two's utility. And then, yeah, and then the cell correspond to the action. So the last cell here, it corresponds to the action where both player one and player two defected. Is that clear? Questions? Cool. So this is like a famous example uh, to show that individual incentives and overall welfare need not um, align. Right, so we covered that. And then for appeals, we, so for now we're gonna talk about pure strategies for the time being. We'll, we'll get to mixed strategy if we have time. Um, something called a dominant strategy. I'm just gonna read off the definitions here. A dominant strategy is a strategy that produces the highest payoff of any strategy available for every possible action by the other players. So dominant strategy is a very powerful concept. Why is that? Because if a player has a dominant strategy, then he or she doesn't care what other players do at all. They just always play this dominant strategy. So let's look at two examples. Um, let's just look at the example here first. Um, so if you look at this example, firm one, um, so this is like a production choice game where firm one gets to choose to uh, have a high or low production, and then firm two is the same. Let's not care too much about the exact scenario. Just look at, pay attention to the numbers, uh, which are the utilities and payoffs for both for, uh, firm one, firm two. Um, in this case, uh, if you look at, for the if for firm one choose the high strategy, then uh, the firm will get two and four as payoff respectively. But if firm one chooses the low strategy, the firm, firm will get two and five respectively. So if you're firm one, which one would you choose? Low. low, exactly. So in this case, low is a dominant strategy for firm, firm one. Does firm two have a dominant strategy in this case? No. Yeah, firm two. So in, because uh, firm, if firm two chooses high, then the payoff would be two and seven. Low would be five and three. So you know, it, it's. There's no case where you know it's both higher than the other. So this is this is a dominant. So firm one has a dominant strategy, which is low. But if we come and look at this case, so this table and that table is very similar. The only difference is here, where it's a one instead of two. So similarly, firm one has a dominant strategy in this case, and then that stra strategy is also a strictly dominant strategy. Why? Because in that case. Um, High and low for firm one is both a two, and in this case, choosing low is significantly better in both cases for firm one. So this concept is useful when you need to do more things, <laughs> uh, but it's just good to know for now. All right. Huh. Next, let's cover the very famous Nash, Nash equilibrium. Um, so this is a definition where you know, it, it describes a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, equilibrium is a, prof, a profile of strategies such that each player's strategy is a best response against the equilibrium strategies of the other players. It's a mouthful. And then, but, um, so I wanna highlight a few words here. So this is, we're, we're, firstly, we're looking at a pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Uh, so we're just saying in this, in this context, every player choose one action and stick with that one action. So think about another example is like paper, rock, paper, scissors. So you can only choose one, which one would you pick? A mixed strategy would be, okay, I'll play, if you have like 10 games, I'll, I'll, with like one third chance I'll pay, uh, choose paper, one third chance choose uh, rock, and one third chance to choose uh, Caesars, that's a mixed strategy. So pure strategy is like rock all the way. That is a pure strategy. So a pure strategy, the pure strategy Nash 
Nash equilibrium is a profile strategy. So this is not just your choice of strategy. This has to be true for every player. And then every player has to be doing, has to be picking a best response strategy against whatever the rest of the player is playing. So, um, great. So since everybody's read the paper, uh, I'm sure you've, <laughs> you've seen this uh, formula appeared many times. So this is like part of the formal definition. Oh, before that, I want to highlight something. Uh, just like no notation might be confusing. So AI means I's action. And then A minus I is other players' action. So this is saying, whatever this is saying, it's just saying, um, let's say player I, uh, player's utility, when player I is picking AI as a strategy, well, the rest of the players picking A minus I as a strategy, it's this, in this case, the utility is greater than any other action that this AI could have chosen. So all this is saying that AI is a best response for player I when A minus I is fixed. So that's the definition of best response. So they use this, I keep on hitting this fan. <laughs> they use this definition, uh, they, they use this formula for like three definitions. So we covered dominant strategy just now. So this is saying that for uh, so when A minus I, so this is for all the A minus I's out there. You have like regardless of what their the other players do. And then player I plays this action and they get utilities always greater than anything else. So this is for the dominant strategy. Well, for best response, as we discussed just now, is for a given set of actions that's already picked by other players, and then the best, like the, the best action that can be picked by player I, which yields the most utility for that player I. And Nash equilibrium is saying that everybody in this society or in this game, they are playing the best response against everybody else. It's very confusing, I know, especially when you go into like the formal definition, because conceptually, if you understand each concept like just by itself, it's understandable. But when you use a formal definition, suddenly some things just start kind of mess up. Uh, I just like to put all these together, uh, but they all make sense. So, so what are some uh, of the properties of Nash e equilibrium? So first of all, it's stable. This is very, very important. We're always saying that nobody, when it's Nash equilibrium, nobody has any incentive to move away from the situation. So recall, I think I have more examples. Yes. Um, and also the second property is that it's possible to have uh, multiple Nash equilibria. So let's look at some examples, because I think I rambled about definitions too much. Um, so this is a game called the Battle of the Sexes. So the setup is like this. Let's say um, Tim, my husband, and I, we want to go see a movie. And then I want to see train spotting. And Tim wants to say, uh, see 500 Days of Summer. And then we, if we go to 500 Days of Summer, Tim's going to get more utility out of it. He's going to get three. I'm going to get one. But why do I still get a positive utility? Is because I get to be with Tim. And then we get to go to the cinema together, spend some time together. That's a positive utility. Um, so vice versa. So if we, we go see train spotting, I'm going to get three. Tim's going to get one. However, if we kind of like, I, I go and see uh, train spotting, Tim go and see um, 500 days of summer, um, just like we each see our preferred film, the whole experience, because I'll be thinking, oh, now I don't get to spend time with my husband. So it kind of offsets the, <laughs> the value I get out of the movie. Okay, so this is the setup. It's, it's called the Battle of the Sexes game. Um, so do we know what are the 
Nash equilibrium or Libra here. Yes. Well, both uh, where where you both take the same movie. Right? We both take the same same movie. Why why is that Nash? Because if you move away, like nobody has any incentive to change to the other because it would just get worse unless both change at the same time. Correct. So, yes, and then. Um, an important thing here is that you can't really discuss and then both make the move. You have, you, you have to think about this as uh, if only one of the players can change at a time. So then in this case, if, you know, if Tim decides to move, then you know, both of our utilities decrease. If I decide to move, like both of our decrease, uh, utilities uh, decrease. So there are two Nash e uh, equilibria here, which is XX and YY. So there are also two Nash equilibrium Libra here. Um, can someone tell me why there's no one? Uh, OK, so I, I, sh I should probably explain this game. Um, so this hawk dove game, I can think of it as hawk is aggressive uh, and doves are peaceful. Um, so if, you know, if the two players are both aggressive, uh, they both get zero zero. If one is aggressive uh, and the other one's peaceful, the aggressive one gets more utility and the peaceful one gets less utility. And if both are peaceful, then they get uh, equal amount, which is less than the aggressor alone, but it's more than um, the peaceful one when it's against um, an aggressive opponent. Isn't that essentially the same as the prisoner's dilemma? Mm -hmm. Not quite. Um, yeah, similar. Yeah, similar. No, but isn't the difference that in the asymmetric case, so when one of them is a hawk and the other one is a dog, then they're better off than when they're both hawks, whereas in the in the prisoner's dilemma, right? If you both defect, that's still better than if only one of you defects. Okay, let's, let's go for the guy who get us. Out, right? mm. I mean, yeah, wait. I'm oh, sorry, I mean, for the guy who. No, but behind the, the, the order is the same. Ideally, you will be the guy uh, confessing while the other guy doesn't confess. It's the best outcome. Yes. And then the second best outcome is you both don't confess, and then the, the third best outcome is the other guy confesses and they don't. Uh, is that the same oh here, so no. yeah. yeah, so uh, makes sense. I'm going to Google it. Equilibrium. Um, one is better, one is worse. The worst is there. And then the other one, this is the best outcome, though. Oh, uh, it's the best outcome. Yeah, it's very similar. But they have, wait, but the equilibrium's different in those two cases. So they're definitely different games. Yeah. Hang on, are they different? No, I'm confused, ow. <laughs> uh, wait, so, so, so okay. So the e equilibrium in this case would be hawk, hawk. Hawk and uh, hawk. Oh no, no, the equilibrium is different in this case because the dove hawk and hawk dove would be the equilibrium in this case in this game. Well, in prisons, because uh, here from here, um, if if the if the if everybody moves up, so if one of them move up, then they will get less utility, and then if like. The only person with incentive to move that way would be the dove, but dove's choice is already thus. So the other column, when, uh, player two, sorry. When you are in the cell, then the only person who gets better off moving that direction would be player one, but player, player one's choice is already dove. Okay. 
right? So the player is not in player two's interest to move that direction. Mm -hmm. So this case, this is definitely a different game because this game's equilibrium is different from the prisoner's dilemma. Makes sense? I'll have, I lost you all. Yeah? I think it's still just because, like I said, when, when you, you know, when, when your opponent rats you out in the prisoner's dilemma, that's the worst that can happen to you, right? Whereas yeah. here, the worst that can happen is that, you know, you both fight to the death. Oh, right, yeah. It's, it's a different, such a different level. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah, that, that's the difference. Let's look at that. So the prisoner's dilemma here. So when you are in the this this bottom um, bottom left cell, when you're playing D C, then um, the player player one always loses going up. Player one would lose go up, but player one, uh, player two has the incentive to move to <coughs> to to defect, right? So then. Yeah, so then player two gets less um, less penalty there. So that's the difference. So that's why player. So in this case, the D D is the is an equilibrium. Yeah. yeah, because C C will cause you know either player to move to the the corner to to these two direction, right? Also, the setup for this one specifically is that you are not supposed to check, like you, you don't know the others. Well, you said normally the case, you don't know the others pick here. Yeah. You're not you're not supposed to change your choice afterwards. So that's, is, isn't that fundamentally different as well? Yeah, yeah but in the definition of, <coughs> the of, the, of the equilibrium, the, the, the whole point is that if, if you are in that, if, if everyone chooses that, then no one can on their own make a change, you know, because it's only AI, if, if you look at the formula, right, the rest is just verbiage, but if you look at the formula, you can see that it's only AI that you change to AI prime, but all the other coordinates stay the same. So this corresponds to moving, you know, horizontally or vertically in, in the table. Oh, yes, so, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the setup is the same, so for both games, as in the like what a person can do or cannot do. It can, you cannot go from CC to DD in one step, mm. but you can do it in two steps, here and then here. So in the other game, is that you move once, not this one, you move once and you're stuck there. You won't move anymore. There's no more incentive for anybody to move there anymore. So that's the difference. Yeah. So yeah. So essentially, um, again, Nash e equilibrium is stable. So there's no incentive for anyone to deviate from his or her current action. One player, any player, any one player. So then the and the next question is: Are there are there cases where there is no Nash e equilibrium for a game? Now, how about this case? This is a penalty kick um, game where you have a goalie, you have a kicker, and then the goalie can go left or right, the kicker can go left or right. Uh, if they both go left, then, you know, then the goalie gets, then the kicker gets negative one, and the goalie managed to save the, go the goal, so then a uh, goalie gets one. Um, but if, uh, if the goalie, if the kicker goes left, well, the goalie goes right, and then the kicker scores, then kicker gets one, goalie gets negative one, so on and so forth. So this is also known as a matching pennies game. So in this case, anyone has a, is there a equilibrium, a Nash equilibrium? All right, so the, in this case, there's no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. So one of them is gonna win, one way or another. Um, it's more like if you always go left, or if you always go le left, uh, sorry, if, if, if the kicker goes left and goalie goes left, and then the kicker can be like, all right, so then I can be better off if I move to the right. 
right? But when the, when the kicker moves to the right, then the goalie's like, okay, I can be better off when I move to the right. So the goalie would also move. And then the kicker's like, all right, then I can be better off moving to the left. So the, it goes on in a circle. So this one never settles. So it's not an equilibrium um, for a pure strategy game. But there is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Um, can someone tell me what it is? Because they both 50-50 chance go left or right. And then what would be the expected utility for each player then in this case? Zero. Yes, <laughs> it will be zero. So this is like conceptually, so if I go left 50% of the time, and then I'll win 50% of the time. And if I go right 50% of the time, so like this is a case for both the goalie and the kicker conceptually. But um, is this because it's a zero sum game and sort of random as well? Like the choices are random and it's zero sum? Um, yeah, so the, the, the question is how do you decide what's the percentage to random on which strategy? So this is obvious in this case concept because it's, it's symmetric. So you know, um, you know, you, you know to go 50% left to 50% right. And then the case is the same for both the kicker and the goalie. Um, so the next, what we're, we're going to look at how we're going to calculate this. Um, so this is how you calculate it. No, this is not how, not how you calculate it. But uh, this, is, this is like the formal definition uh, of a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Um, so let's see. Uh, where's my mouse? There. Come on. All right, so in this case, SIAI or SJAJ here, that, that represents the probability that an action is chosen. So in our case, this is like 50%, right, for uh, left, for a goalie. Um, and then this, as we know, this is a utility that's yield from action A. Um, so all this is saying is that this action that I'm picking here um, with, let's sum up like all the possible cases uh, with the probability, each case's probability times the utility that I get out of that case, and I sum them together, is going to be greater than any other action that I could have chosen. So all that we throw in here different from the pure strategy equilibrium is that we throw in this probability. So then, yes? That's just expectation, essentially. Expectation of utility for strategy. Correct. Yeah, this is, exactly. So that's the expected return given this, yeah. But then, so then the question, yeah. But on the right hand side, you, you, you have, so, okay, so on the left hand side, you, you, you randomly choose even the I strategy, right? But on the right hand side, you, you, you always choose a given other, you know, AI prime. So it's, it's, it's like it's not really comparing, um, it's comparing a mixed strategy against a semi mixed one. Or no. <laughs> so you're comparing a mixed strategy to a mixed strategy. So this is just like for any of the probability, any of the um, ways that you can combine the distribute these probabilities and you have a profile a, a way of structuring your probabilities that you're going to get the maximum return yeah but you never really choose you, you, know, you never get to choose si prime never get to choose si prime what do you mean you never get to choose si well, prime I mean, it's like on the right hand side right mm-hmm take all the other components and, and yeah, they have some weights but but for i for the i component you just take ai prime always whereas on the left hand side you know i is one of the j's so you have some si which tells you the probability of picking like uh huh? No, prime but the a ai ai prime is like is for all of the ai prime so it might be easier, it might be clearer when I go into an example and then expand this formula. 
it's a strange. Yeah, but, that, but but exactly. But for, for any choice of AI prime, you still you know you commit to only being that AI prime, right? Because on the right hand side, you never you know you never introduce an SI prime which tells you the probability of picking AI prime. You commit to AI prime because it's not one of you know it's not in the product of probability. Yeah, that's big strategy is already given. That's not changing. What's changing is your UI. So agent I is action, which is AI prime here and AI over there. So it's saying compare AI to any other action I could have taken, which is AI prime. But the the ratio of these actions or the mixed strategy that remains the same for this proposition. That's just one. It's a function because you're evaluating one mixed strategy. I'm gonna give you an example. So. If it's still not clear, then let's argue afterwards, because I have like a million more slides to go through after this. Um, because that's just the definition. Uh, OK, so go back to this game, but with some modification. Um, so this is saying that the kicker is better at kicking to the right than to the left. So when the kicker kicks to the right, instead of getting negative 1 and 1, kicker is getting um, a 0, and the goalie is getting getting a zero. Um, so this is just a slight modification which makes this game biased. This, is, this assumes that the goalie knows that the kicker is better at the right. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. So this is saying that knowing this, how should the, both the kicker and the goalie allocate um, like, or strategize how to, whether they, to kick right or to go to the right to save the ball. Um, Yeah, yeah. So this is where we're gonna come, we're gonna figure out like what is the mixed strategy for the kicker and the volley and the goalie. There. So now we're looking at that section. So um, the kicker, the kicker's goal, or rather, the condition that will satisfy, uh, will, which will help us find out the strategy, is that. The kicker's goal is for the goalies to be indifferent whether to go left or to go right. So the, I'll just write this out. Um, so let's say the kicker has a probability of p of going right, and then have a probability of one minus k, uh, p of going left. So how it goes is uh, we have then we look at uh, goalie's utility when it's going left, which is 1 minus p times 1 times this um, plus um, p times negative 1, this guy, and then equals when goalie goes to the right, which is 1 minus p times negative 1. And then so we expand this. I should really not do that. So let's just do 1 minus 2p equals negative 1 plus p. And now we move everything to one side. p equal to 2 thirds. So what this is saying is that the kicker is better off um, kicking more often to the right. And if you go through the same um, process for the goalie, and you will see that the goalie is actually going to uh, favor the right, going to the right hand side as well. Does that make sense? So what's the odd about that is if you look at this, um, so the, it makes sense for the kickers to go to the right because the, kick, uh, the kicker is stronger on the right hand side. Um, but if you look at this whole matrix, it's like for the goalie to go right, it's actually goalies getting less utility out of it. But in this case, the goalie is going to the right as an adjustment to the kicker's um, um, sort of strategy. So then the expected utilities, you can just calculate. So like by doing that, the expected utility for the goalie is already there. So it's like negative, the total would be like negative one, one third, I think. And then the util expected utility for the kicker is positive one third. 
So this is how you calculate it. Does that formula make sense now? No? We can discuss that later. <laughs> uh, do we have time to go through this? Or should we go to the next speaker? Uh, well, we have to 8.30, it's an hour each. OK, awesome. So then, uh, well, I guess then we, we, don't, we already took enough questions. <laughs> Uh, so then the next up is the extensive form game. Just now we were talking about the normal form game, um, which is the simple form. Extensive form, if you notice that we did not touch timing at all or order um, of the player. So just now it was just like, if you know, like pretty much we're, we're assuming like everybody play at the same time and then people know everybody's strategy and then you can change, you can sort of formulate your strategy based on what other people's strategy is. And in this case, um, the extensive form game is more complicated in the, we're just throwing in the, uh, the, the order of the move. Um, and also we, we, we keep the property that they, um, they sort of, they, it, it's transparent, like they know others' moves. Um, so this is a formal definition. Just kidding, you're not gonna, we're not gonna go through that. Uh, it, it, like even the author in the paper, he didn't go through the full definition, just because his annotation is crazy. Uh, so instead, he um, he zoomed in on like a subset of an extensive form game, which is a finite game of perfect information. Finite being that you know, um, player every player has a fixed number of moves uh, in a fixed order. Um, and then perfect information is that uh, the player, every player knows what the previous player's actions are. Um, so in, in the paper, there was this uh, game that was presented as a form or, uh, form, normal form game, uh, which is in this ca table where it's from one, two firms choose not uh, to advertise or to not advertise. When they both choose not to advertise, they both get a higher number and then we, when one of them choose to advertise the one the advertise gets a higher number the other one gets hurt um, and then when they both advertise they both get a lower number so then this can be converted to a finite game of perfect information by simply allowing firm one to choose to move first so for uh, so let's look at this this tree here uh, normally, a fi uh, this kind of finite game of perfect information can be represented and is normally represented by a tree. Um, so then the player one, firm one, uh, can choose to advertise or not advertise. Player two then choose, knowing player one's strategy, then they will choose to advertise or not advertise. And then the numbers down here denotes firm one's utility and then firm two's utility at the end of the play. Ah, straightforward enough. So, to the whiteboard again. Oh, it's a shame that I can't have that light shine here. Ah, uh, that's a bit distracting. Oh, yes, please. Can you bring on these lights and then... So, I like to focus your attention here in this bottom right corner. So this represents just now that game. Oh, shit. Ah, here. <laughs> I even got the tree here and the utilities here. Um, so what I did here is to uh, annotate the, each pass with different notations to make it less confusing. So this is advertised, this is not. For firm one, this is uh, advertised, not advertised, advertised, not advertised for firm two. So I'm just av uh, annotating them with A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. Reason why is that so if you look at the action profile of firm one, so available actions for firm, firm one is to advertise or not advertise, straightforward enough. But for uh, firm two, um, the action profile is actually uh, just don't even, don't like ignore firm one's action. So think about it this as you are uh, a person from firm one and you're planning your available actions. So you have to prepare for the case where firm one advertises or not advertise, right? So then you can choose either B1, C1, B1, C2, or B2, C1. You can't choose B1, B2 at the same time. That makes sense? So that's why we have all this combination here. So to fill up the number here, so when firm one, when firm one advertise, when 
A1 is picked, and then firm 2 has B1, B1, and C1. So in this case, you can see, actually, it's, it, it comes down to this path. C1 is not activated. But as firm 2, you don't know that beforehand. That's why it's part of your action profile. So what's happening here is that this is going to result in 6-6. Six, six. Anything that here is still C1, the C1 and C2, they're not going to be triggered in this case. And then when it's, um, when it's A2, and then when it's A2, C1 is uh, A1, sorry, A1 and then B2, this is 13 and 7. And then this case is A2, no, this is A2 and A1 and B2, right? So wait. Is still 13 and 7? Yeah. yeah, because B2 is picked. Uh-huh. And then in this case, is B1 and C1. So it's 7 and 13. And this is 7 and 13. B1 and A2. Oh, my God. And then C2, yeah, it's 16 and 12. In this case, is eight, seven, thirteen, and then sixteen and twelve. Okay, so this is a bit. All right, so, um, so the interesting bit here is, so let's look at the strategies when, uh, when firm one chooses A one. What would firm two choose? So firm two's utilities are these numbers. So firm two would be better off picking this one or this one, right? Um, that is just saying that firm two would go to, like this, this pass is gonna be picked. And then C1 or C2, it doesn't make a difference. Great, so in this case, when when uh, firm one is going with A2, and then firm two is better off either this case or this case. Okay, so then what's interesting is that, just note A2, B1, C1, A2, B2, C1, these both are, um, like equilibrium, Nash equilibrium, according to this calculation. Can we have the projector on and have this off? So keep that in mind. Don't forget. Just one minute, we'll get there. So the interesting part is, so if you notice just now what we arrived at, the, the one that's highlighted, that's one of the equilibrium right there. What's the problem with that? Equilibrium. Because you can't choose the second one after the first one choose one, or not. So, so this is saying that this is kind of like saying firm two is threatening for firm one. Firm 2 is saying, you know, if you come down this advertise route, I'm just going to advertise, and we're go both going to end up with 6. And the Firm 1 is like, all right, I will not advertise, and then end up with this, this score. But this doesn't make any sense, because if you look at this part, Firm 2, by choosing to advertise in this scenario, is actually getting less utility. So that's why this is a non-credible threat. So how do we... How do we how do we deal with such a case? So that's where the backward induction comes in. So how to do backward induction is, if we look at this subgame, what choice does it make sense for firm two in this case? Because firm two is the only one who's choosing this subgame. And then obviously, it will be not to advertise. And then in this subgame, 
which one makes sense for a firm too, obviously, is to advertise. So then we reduce this game to that game. And with this game, then firm, firm two is out of the picture. Then it's up to firm, firm one to choose with this given utility. And obviously, firm one will choose to advertise. So by doing this, we arrived at the one and only equilibrium, which is this one. So this is a concept known as a subgame perfect equilibrium. Um, this is just saying, you know, given that a tree like that, a game represented in a tree like that, any of the any of the sub tree has to sa uh, uh, has to um, be uh, be in a equilibrium. So that's how we arrived at th this solution. That's why that solution doesn't make sense because because this is not sub tree sub game equilibrium. But if if you're for two and one to four. Firm one could be, you know, to go down that round. Okay. Like you basically, if you want to turn that tr thread credible, uh -huh. does that fit into the model? Like some kind of pre-commitment that firm two says whatever happens, I'm going to advertise. Well, the thing is, then it needs to be incorporated in the utility, right? In this case, in this case, that the firm two thread is not credible because it's if firm one actually goes down that route, the firm two will pick the the not advertised strategy. Yeah, but this is what I'm saying, but if firm two was able to pre-commit to advertising. But I'm saying that that is not, uh, that is not, then, then you're letting firm two to pick first. So in this case, we're representing this game. Firm one always has the first move. Right, so then, then, your, then your firm two has to be up on the, tr uh, like closer to the root, or be the root node. Right, so this whole point is that the order matters. So like you can see, like just, just adding one more condition, your game suddenly became different, and then you will have to deal with it differently. Um, so yeah, so I think I'm done. Uh, the only thing that's left is that uh, when I posted this idea on Facebook, a certain professor uh, protested. He said, "Our game uh, papers we love is for CS people. What are you doing, uh, economic paper paper for?" So, <laughs> just to link it back to CS, uh, we all know who this person is, and then he's the one who came up with this mean max theorem theorem, which which is fundamental to game theory. Um, and then just like what we did there. Um, it can also be derived, or rather, yeah, it, like the how uh, the kicker's goal is to make it, uh, you know, the two strategy indifferent for the goalie. Um, it can be derived from the min max theorem as well. So this is like homework. Uh, <laughs> and then what's the point of all this, you may ask? Oh. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so, you know, I. If you've heard of this pay-per-click game, uh, then if you get far enough, uh, then you will see that there is actually a, like some games there uh, you can play. So you can write an AI and then use the strategies that we've talked about today um, to do proper, you know, strategy picking. So that's the whole point of this talk. Thank y'all. Questions? We have four minutes for four questions. Minutes. No questions, great. <laughs> <laughs>